Amen. Church, you may be seated. Hey, good morning, guys. Good morning. good morning. Good to see you guys. Good morning to Mercy Northeast, Mercy Union County. We have got a, a great morning this morning um, in God's Word, but we're going to be over in Ephesians 5. Let me go ahead and tell you where we're going. Ephesians chapter 5. So you got your Bible, open it up, make your way there. Uh, if you do not own a copy of God's Word, a copy of the Bible, we would love to give you one at all of our campuses. Just make your way out to the next steps area after service, and we'll give you one. I'll have all the words on the screen for today, so you'll be good. Uh, but we got a really cool thing, um, especially today. Ephesians 5 is basically, it's going to be a pretty simple passage in terms of understanding it. It's going to call us to live out our faith, not just know it, not just talk about it, but actually live it. Let our actions demonstrate the faith we believe. That's what we're going to be swimming in all day today. And it's kind of a cool day because um, we've got an opportunity here, November 12th, has been set aside by a bunch of um, Christian organizations and churches as something called Stand Sunday. And the idea is that Christians take a moment to stand up for children that are in foster and adoptive care, um, that are in the foster care system. Uh, And what's been happening is pretty cool here at Mercy. A few of our members have started taking steps to kind of organize a foster and adoption care ministry here at Mercy Church, just getting started. And y'all, you think about how this is why I say it fits beautifully with our message. It's going to be all about living out our faith. I mean, Romans 8 says that we are adopted by God as children. That's the language it uses to talk about the gospel message and what God has done for us. James 1 says probably the most purest form of religion is caring for widows and orphans in their distress. And so I think we think about Mecklenburg and Union County, and y'all, there's some real need. There's 659 kids in the foster care um, systems in Mecklenburg and Union County, but there are fewer than 60 families currently licensed uh, with Mecklenburg County in specific and only a handful in Union County. The median number of days a child is in care in Mecklenburg County is 502 days right now. There are 45 what are classified as true orphans waiting to be adopted. These are youth whose parental reunification efforts have been terminated, um, and so they're just waiting on a home. So what we want to do is we just want to take a second, bring awareness to it. God is leading our church to get more involved in this ministry, and in a moment we're all going to stand and we're going to pray together for God's grace and for God to uh, motivate us into action and for us to respond to God in that. But before we all stand, I recognize that there are some of you that have already taken steps. You're already in this work some way or another. So at all three of our services happening right now, if you are or have been involved in any way um, in foster care or adoption, we want to recognize you and ask you to, to stand first. Here's what I mean. I mean, respite care, fostering children you've adopted, you're a social worker who works with foster care and adoption. Look, we don't mean to single you out in any other way other than to say we want you to know your church sees you. We want to be a church that follows your leadership and want to celebrate uh, the work that God is doing in and through you. So if you've been involved, we kind of take a, take a shot here. It might be, not be anybody in the room, okay, in any of our rooms. But if you are, we at least want to acknowledge you before we all stand together. So if that's you, you are uh, been involved in any of those ways that I mentioned in adoption and foster care, would you... Stand up right now, wherever you are, just right at your seat, stand up. Oh, wow. Can we take a second, y'all, and praise God uh, for what he's doing? Praise God. Praise God. Stay standing. Stay standing. Um, I want you to stay standing because uh, we've got a small gift 
for you that our teams are bringing around at all of our campuses is um, money towards Chick-fil-A food uh, just to help you feed all those mouths. Um, wish that it could be more. It's certainly not worthy of the sacrifice that you've given. Uh, let me ask now, let me ask everybody at all of our campuses to stand up as well. Um, and if you are close by one of these families and, or individuals you saw stand up, we're going to pray. Um, I would ask you to just kind of lean over to them, maybe put your hand on their shoulder and believe God on their behalf. And let's surround them in prayer as we pray together as one church uh, that God would lead us to look more like Jesus through ministry like this. Let's, let's pray together. Father, thank you so much. Thank you for your grace that you have seen fit to bring us home as children, bring us home into your family. You have adopted us through the shed blood of Christ, and we are forever in your home, and we praise you for that. Thank you for our brothers and sisters and their testimony as they live that out in their own lives that we've seen here today. Thank you for these testimonies, and I pray for many more, Father. Would Mercy Church be a church that loves in deed, not just in word? God, help us to display the love of Christ to these children in need in our community. Give us willing hearts, open hands, open lives to what you would have us do. And thank you so much for the hope we have in the gospel. Thank you for our brothers and sisters that are already in this. Would you strengthen them, protect them, multiply their endurance, patience, love, strength, wisdom, multiply it, Father, to your glory. Would they be raising up the next generation of worshipers and disciple makers who prayed in Christ's holy name. Amen. Amen. All right. You can be seated. Hey, I will say um, one final thing on this. Like I said, we're kind of getting this ministry off the ground, still very early stages here at Mercy Church. Um, Pastor Richard Barnes is helping to organize this effort from kind of the uh, pastoral side of things. So if you want to get more information on that, Email Pastor Richard, his email's on the screen there. Um, back over into Ephesians 5 we go. Like I said, God is going to call us plain and simple to live out our faith. But instead of saying live it out, he's going to use the language walk. He's going to use the language walk. Now, growing up, uh, my dad had a saying that he drilled into me when I was young, and maybe you can finish the saying too. Dad said over and over and over, you don't talk the talk. You walk the walk. You walk the walk. And he applied it to every area. He applied it to sports because young men, a lot of testosterone going out on the court. You love to talk the talk. But there is nothing better than shutting a guy up, right, by walking the walk. So he trained me this life lesson. You don't talk the talk. You walk the walk. You go, I'm like, Dad, I'm going to get good grades to school. He's like, you can say it all you want. But you get out there, you work hard in your grades, you walk the walk. He trained me, talk is cheap. He trained me, there's little value in just saying a bunch of words. And I think about that every Sunday as I stand up here and say a bunch of words for like half an hour <laughs> to you guys, like making dad proud, right? Uh, but there really is a really good point in this. Actions speak, you've heard it, actions speak louder than words. I told you today, nothing's going to be super complicated today. It's going to be a question of will we receive it from the Lord. God is going to call us to walk the walk. And maybe you didn't have a dad who told you to walk the walk, but you had DJ Unk, the great American philosopher, who said you got to walk it out, right? And if you want him to get started on that, I'm not going to do it. Um, but look, the Apostle Paul repeatedly, he's going to call the Christian life a walk. He's been doing that in the book of Ephesians. Y'all, my concern for us as a church in the Bible Belt and the American Southeast is that we do a lot more talking than walking. We get good at speaking the Christian language, Christianese. We're all fluent in it, right? But if our mouths were shut and our actions were the only thing that could speak for us, what does our walking say about what we believe? I know the gospel is an announcement. It should be spoken. Yes, of course. But our life should match it. So today's a lot about how to walk it out. Not just talk about Jesus, but walk a life that looks like Jesus. Three simple parts to it. And this is just a breakdown of the text, okay? From the security that you and I have as God's beloved children, we're to walk in love, we're to walk in light, and we're to walk in wisdom. Look, it's, it's simple, I'm telling you. The challenge for you today will not be do I understand God's word, the challenge is going to be, 
oh my goodness, I do understand it. Am I willing to submit to it? Am I willing to actually submit to it? Because maybe the breakthrough you need in your Christian life is to devote less energy to talking and more energy to walking. In fact, I actually think for some of you, the breakthrough is going to come when you recognize that the prayers you've been praying, God is going to answer them through your obedience to his commands. You start obeying, I'm telling you, it's going to revolutionize your life as you walk out your faith. So starting Ephesians 5, verse 1, we'll try and get to verse 21 today. That's my goal. Here we go. Verse 1, therefore be imitators of God as dearly loved children. This is that kind of first part of that main point I gave you. Before he gets into walking instructions, he, he takes some pressure off, but he, he says in light of the gospel, therefore, remember, whatever you say therefore, what's it there for? He finished chapter 4 calling us. He referred us back to the gospel. He said, forgive one another. How? Just as God in Christ forgave you in light of what God has done for you, therefore, and then he says the one, like if I had to summarize this whole sermon in one little phrase, it's imitate God. Oh my, imitate God. Well, of course, you're going to fail at that. You can't imitate him perfectly. Some things, in fact, you can't imitate from him at all. Like you cannot imitate his all-powerfulness, his all-knowingness. There's some things about God, theologians call them the incommunicable attributes of God. The things that you just can't do. That Christians are just supposed to sit in awe of and they're to lead us to worship him more and go, wow, look how big and awesome God is. Right? You can't do those things. You can't imitate them. But there are some character traits of God, the communicable attributes of God that we can imitate. Things like love, patience, kindness, faithfulness, holiness, and so on. Now, here's the relief though. You do it as dearly beloved children. You ever see, a, here's why it's a relief. You ever see a young child try to imitate their parent? Like my daughter, when she used to come in at three years old with her mom's shirt on, she's like, ah, mommy, right? You know those, those things that kids do? It's, it's so cute and we chuckle, but it is a childish imitation, nowhere near the real thing. But here's the deal. The little children aren't worried about being embarrassed because they're so secure in their parents' love. So as they imitate their father or their mother, right, little children, they're not worried, right? They're so loved and so secure in it that they can imitate. That's the kind of godliness God is calling us to. We'll never fully imitate God, so take the pressure off. It's impossible. But the more we know his love for us, the more we'll be secure enough to imitate his love in the world around us. And if you don't get that, if you don't get that everything he's telling you to do is coming out of his love for you, and you don't find security in that love, I'm telling you, your Christian life is going to be a performance to try and get acceptance from God and others, and it's exhausting. It is exhausting to the soul to live that way, and eventually you'll burn out. You get tired of, you'll always be anxious, worried about what other people think about you, and worried if your scorecard's okay with God. But that, listen, is not what God calls you to. You are not an orphan if you are in Christ. If you've believed on the gospel for your salvation, God says, you're home now. You're secure. You're adopted. Walk as a child of God. And this is also a caution to my non-Christian friends who are here with us today. This is the peace Christians have that you need. Come to Jesus. The rest of the sermon, I'm talking about what the Christian life looks like, but God is calling you to receive from him before he ever calls you to live for him. Some of you need to just receive today. Receive the love of God for you. Christians, you are a loved child of God. Now walk like it. Verse 2, walk in love. Walk in love. How? As Christ also loved us and gave himself for us. Walk in love as, so there's some sort of clarifier around the nature of that love. As Christ also loved us and gave himself for us a sacrificial and fragrant offering to God. This is our first of those three ways to walk. From the security you have in God, uh, as God's adopted child, walk in love. That's the first one, walk in love. Now, like I said, there's some defining to it. And that's important because, y'all, so often we just don't have a good definition of love that's floating around the culture around us right now, right? We just love to say all kinds of things. I love my wife. I love the Panthers. I love Taco Bell. 
right? We say it about, there, that is Blake Templeton, our associate campus pastor. That's his life manifesto right there, okay? Um, we're a little too free with that word. And the problem is we get in here then in church and we see the word love in the Bible, walk in love. What does that mean? Look, I, we've been talking a little bit about kind of the world versus the word. And I want to give you a couple of ideas that the world, the way the world talks about love, kind of lies about love, that you can understand so you can contrast it against what it's saying right here. What the world says is that love is only a feeling. This is the, it, it's the idea that love is something passive. So you can fall into love. It just comes over you. You know, Disney, the heart wants what it wants. You have no control. I fell in love. Well, the problem is if you fall in love, you can fall back out of love. This is why the divorce rate is as high as it is, because some, that, that feeling you claimed as love that happened to you goes away, and all that's left is the work of marriage, and you don't want it. But then the word of God comes along and says, well, love can't just be a, a passive feeling that happens to you, because God commands us to love. Like, it's an act, love the Lord your God, love your neighbor. It's got to be more than a feeling. It's not a passive feeling that happens to you. It's an active decision you choose to make. But the world also says love is only affirmation, right? Love is unconditional affirmation of whatever path I choose. If you love me, you'll affirm me no matter what my decision is. This is the position many Christians, I know you're being asked to take up in your workplace right now and, and seminars and HR training right now. You've told me are intent on building this culture of unquestioned affirmation. By the way, let me say this is an impossibly hard time right now if you work in the HR area. So, man, I'm happy to, I've been praying for you the past couple of years and I'm happy to pray with you because I know your stress level is high. But a Christian perspective, we said a few weeks ago, we got to reject the idea that love equals just unconditional affirmation. It's got to be more than that, right? Because logically it's crazy. Like I love my kids more than anyone else. And I also have told them no more than anyone else. Right? Because if I affirmed all their decisions, they'd all be dead. Right? That's just, <laughs> we know that. Right? That's, love must be more than a feeling. Love must be more than just affirmation. So what does God say love is? The God's word, its idea of love, look at the verse, verse 2. It's sacrificial. Just as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us. Love is not primarily feeling or affirmation. Love is a decision. And it's a decision to sacrifice myself, hear me, for the good of others. What if that began, you began to characterize the way that you loved in the world around you? How can I sacrifice? I, I love something. Okay, how do I sacrifice myself for the good of others in that setting? That will revolutionize how you treat people, how you treat your stuff. Right? You get around people. What do we all know? The more you're around someone, the more likely it is that they sin against you. Right? The more likely y'all engage in conflict. And what if my response is love instead of what the world would say is get vengeance. Right? You have been harmed. Exercise vengeance against that person. What if instead you saw love as, no, I'm going to sacrifice myself for the good of others, which means what did Ephesians 4.32 say right at the end of Ephesians 4? I'm going to forgive just as Christ forgave me. I'm going to take the punishment on myself in that case. I'm not going to exercise judgment on them. I'll take it on. I'll take the hurt and I'll choose forgiveness. And I'm not going to wait till I'm in a, till I feel like I'm in a forgiving mood or something. I'm going to choose to sacrifice myself for the good of another and forgive. Let's apply that to another area. Paul says our love should be like Christ and a, a fragrant and sacrificial offering to God. How would your giving change if it was in response to the gospel, like Paul says here in verse 2? Talking about financial generosity. A lot of times we give out of our leftovers, give out of excess, give when we feel like it. But in his sacrificial love for us, he gave his only son. Y'all, sacrificial love means sacrifice. Some of you, I don't know your story. You might make millions of dollars every year and could write a check that could make you easily the largest giver at our church or something like that. But does that actually mean for you it would be a gift worthy of the gospel? Because even if it met a financial need, it may not be a fragrant and sacrificial offering to God. It may just be out of your surplus, not a sacrifice worthy of the gospel. He calls you to give a sacrifice worthy of his sacrifice for you. And I'll tell you, when you live the world's way and you keep it all for yourself, you will find that it will not satisfy you. 
How many stories do you need to hear of people who build all the wealth in the world only to find their lives empty at the end of it? Don't walk in that. Walk in, and here's the great thing, as we give and as we forgive, God fills our hearts and fills our lives. We find an abundance in him, and that shouldn't surprise us. He created the world to function that way. And when we live as he created it, we flourish. We find joy. Are you walking in a love that's marked by sacrifice? All right, keep going. Verses 3 through 14 is where we're going to shift from walking in love to walking in light. He says this command to walk in light most clearly up in verse 8. So I'm going to start there, and I'll come back and get those uh, 3 through 7. Here we go. For once you were darkness, excuse me, for you were once darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. Walk as children of light. For the fruit of the light consists of all goodness, righteousness, and truth, testing what is pleasing to the Lord. Don't participate in the fruitless works of darkness, but instead expose them. For it's shameful even to mention what is done by them in secret. Everything exposed by the light is made visible, for what makes everything visible is light. Therefore, it says, get up, sleeper, rise up from the dead, and Christ will shine on you. So point two, plain and simple, from the security, still from the security you have as God's adopted child, walk in light. Now, what does he draw you back to? He draws you back to the gospel. You were once in darkness, but God, he actually says, made you light. Isn't that awesome? He changes your nature. That's amazing. And so he says, instead of participating in the fruitless works of your old life, last week, if you were here, chapter four, we we're talking about the Jesus fit. Um, Pastor Jake here at Providence Road talked about Jesus fit. Um, each one of our preachers are talking about basically put off the old self, put on the new. Now it's light and darkness. And he likens it to waking up. Wake up. Don't sleep through this life. Going through the motions. Wake up. Up. This is why we say we want to see God bring a gospel awakening to Charlotte, carried to the ends of the earth. We want to see people woken up. Don't go through the motions. Let the light of the gospel expose the fruitless works of darkness. Now, back in verses 3 through 5, he brought up what those fruitless works of darkness are. He shows what it looks like when life is shrouded in darkness. I want you to hear it. I want you to hear it, reading it, thinking about your own life. But sexual immorality and any impurity or greed should not even be heard of among you, as is proper for saints. Proper for saints simply means it's consistent with the way of light. And sexual immorality, if you were here a couple of weeks ago, we, we used this to, understood this word. The word is porneia in the Greek. It means any sexual expression outside of a husband and wife in marriage. The world around us says it's no big deal. Do whatever you feel like. Y'all, the world is dark. The world is darkness. It is the nature of darkness. Not only are people walking in darkness, the very nature is darkness. And it's just kind of the world is feeling its way through the darkness, saying whatever with whoever. We don't really know. But the gospel shines a light on sex and says, oh, listen, it's a gift that represents an even more powerful union that happens in marriage. It's physical union matched by emotional union financial union and spiritual union, union in every way. And when you try and separate physical union from the rest of these, you're, what? you're walking in darkness. And he goes so far to say, look at verse 5. Every sexually immoral or impure or greedy person who is an idolater does not have an inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and of God. So look. If you, if you say sex outside of marriage is no big deal, you might say, like, you know, we're, we're not ready for marriage, man. We're not ready for that yet. Well, if you're not ready for marriage, you're not ready for sex. But listen, if you're engaged in sexual immorality of any kind, yes, like sleeping with your boyfriend or girlfriend, do you see what he's saying here? And as your pastor, what i got to draw your eyes to? You do not have an inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and of God. And you, you respond, whoa. Pastor Spence, well, I thought you were about grace, man. Whoa, what's this about? I want to say exactly. Stop treating grace like it's so cheap. It's not cheap. Christ 
went up and gave his life for you so that you could be reconciled to God, so that you could be brought into light and now be a child of light and not of darkness. Don't treat his grace like it's cheap. And I'm sorry if this is awkward or uncomfortable because, I mean, maybe that's you or maybe the person sitting beside you and maybe you didn't even know. And now you just got to have a conversation and that's good. The fact that you've heard this today is God's grace on you. Better now than never. Men, take the lead. Leader in light, not darkness. And I'll tell you how you get to the light is through confession. Maybe you just need to find a friend. Find a friend, someone you know and trust that's walking with Jesus. And friends, let's be ready for our brothers and sisters to bring sin to us. Let us not be shocked by sin. You're a sinner. You're a terrible sinner. I'm just going to get all that. Like, we all really are. Confession, which is, we are, um, Dietrich Bonhoeffer said in his book, Life Together. He said, what we are is we are bringers of grace to one another. That's the church. So we bring our sin and we're like, hey, this is the sin. And if it stays in the darkness, it's going to keep growing mutant. I need to bring it into the light. And then we bring, the other one brings grace to one another and says, through the grace of God, that sin has been forgiven in Christ. Now let's walk together free from that. And you know what? Tomorrow, those roles are going to flip. And I'm going to be the one that brings the sin and you're going to bring the grace. Which is why I'm so big on you guys being in community here in the church. Right? You need community with one another. He also says walking in light means there's no room for greed either. Greed's the mentality that I need what I don't have because what I have is not enough. For those who have Christ to live and feel like we don't have enough, that's darkness. You have everything you will ever need in the salvation that God has given you in Christ. You have enough. We got to let the light of the gospel shine on all areas of discontentment in our lives and rest. And maybe what's happening in greed and in sexual immorality is that Christ has not been enough for us. We need to let him be enough for us. Don't buy the darkness the world is selling us. Walk in light because you are light. And listen, if at any point in here, I just, I was feeling this today because I'm like, man, this is such a simple text filled with commands. Live this way, not that way. But what you can miss, because we're all so prone to the checklist, is that all along the way, he's talking about who you are already in Christ. And if you're starting to feel shame, go back to who you are in Christ. If you're starting to feel guilt and condemnation, conviction is good. Conviction is the Lord reminding you of who you are in Christ and calling you to live differently. Guilt, shame, condemnation, those are the tools of our enemy. Don't walk in those. Walk in light, and it starts remembering of who you are. He keeps going. Verse 15, our last how to walk. Pay careful attention then to how you walk, not as unwise people, but as wise. So lastly, our last of these three steps for how to walk from the security, from the security, remember, your nature, your identity, your family, who you have as God's adopted child, walk in wisdom. All right, let me try and put a handle on walk in wisdom because that, of all these, I don't know why this one felt abstract. I guess they all could be, but I don't want you to avoid them because they feel abstract. What does this mean? To walk in wisdom is to learn how to apply biblical principles to every arena of life. Okay, because let's face it, there's not a chapter and verse for every single situation you have. Like, all right, Pastor Smith, I have a job opportunity. One is in Portland. Um, Oregon, one is in Des Moines. Uh, Which one is God calling me to? I'm like, well, it's not going to be in Deuteronomy 13. You know what I mean? Like just an exact, oh, here is the answer. It's usually never Des Moines. I don't know. It feels like a place I would never want to go. But you know what I mean? Like that's that's a totally different thing. Um, But you know what I'm saying? What career field to go into, person to marry, how to budget your time. We'll just talk about that in a second. But there are principles. Sometimes there are like exact commands. He just gave us some, right? There's some that are just flat out easy to follow, but not always. Wisdom is learning how to apply biblical principles to every area of life. It's laying the principles over the situation and letting scripture guide you. And then he gives an example. He's going to give two examples. The first is about your time. Verse 16, making the most of the time because the days are evil. So don't be foolish but understand what the Lord's will is. 
making the most of the time. You know, so <laughs> it, may, it may not be morally wrong for you to watch a lot of TV, but is that the way to make the most of the time? And by the way, this verse is not just like a verse for the, <laughs> I feel like the go-getters in the room are like, ah, life verse right there, you know. <laughs> I'm a three on the Enneagram and a driver and a whatever the blah, 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 blahs tell me. You got to go, 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 go all the time. And now I'm justified. Calm down. All right. That's not what's going on here. It is a, and by the way, you're a blessing. I'm the same way. Okay. So we, God loves you. I love you. And I see you. Okay. But this is a reminder that future days are not promised to us. Time is working against us here on this earth, particularly in our mission to proclaim the gospel to the ends of the earth as God has called us to. So using our time wisely means making the most of our time for things of eternal significance. Y'all, this, it's this thing right here that compelled me into ministry. I'm not saying, by the way, that then therefore everyone should go into full-time vocational ministry. No, but it was the thing that got me is, am, am I making the most of my minutes and hours and days and years for those of you that are in the workplace, how are you using your time in the workplace? God has appointed you and put you there. You might be the only believer there. Are you living and walking and having conversations and relationships and building them for the sake of things of eternal significance so that the kingdom of God might be advanced in that place? Because God has equipped you for that task. Or are you caught up in building kingdoms that won't last? Are you prioritizing the kingdom of God with your time? One of the ways to say it kind of shorthanded here, as you get to know Mercy Church and get involved around here, is we want to challenge you to prioritize the kingdom of God in your time, your talent, and your treasure. And this is talking about your time. Hey, think about 2024 as you're looking out at your calendar. Is all of your PTO for vacation or their short-term mission trips or their days serving the city, sharing the love of Christ right here where you're serving others, not just yourself? Or are you using your time to share the gospel? You know, a common thing I see in people in their 20s is, man, I want to build wealth really fast. I want to devote all my hours to building a lot of wealth fast so that I can relax later. As if peace is going to come from financial security. Peace of the souls that you, you are climbing the ladder really fast and it's leaning on the wrong building. Don't waste your life there. Are you, build, are you giving your time to things of eternal significance? Does what I'm doing with my time have eternal significance? Then he finishes with a warning, and it's kind of this next thing in this wisdom talk. But something that could, that could trip them up pretty easily as they walk with Jesus. Look at verse 18. Don't get drunk with wine, which leads to reckless living, but be filled by the Spirit, speaking to one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making music with your heart to the Lord, giving thanks always for everything to God the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Stop there at verse 20. Why does he compare these two? Drunkenness and spirit filling. Because listen, both are ways to deal with the realities of life. You see, what drunkenness does is it tries to escape, help you escape. I'm going to numb myself to the realities of life. I'm going to deal with my problems by avoiding my problems. But the spirit awakens you to the true realities of life. And that is, you have the Spirit of God and therefore the power of God with you as you walk through the circumstances and situations of your life. You have, what do we say this? Um, God has not given you a spirit of fear, but one of power, love, and sound judgment. And then, what does he do very next? That's verse 18, verse 19. He says, so therefore encourage one another. One another, one another. You know the, this command, one another, followed by like sing to one another, care for one another, serve one another. There are 58 one another's in the New Testament. We need one another. That's why we get in here. That's why I'm so big on the worship gathering. Because we are bringers of grace to one another. And I just need to hear, when you're singing, you're not singing to the stage. You are singing to God and to one another. We are hearing one another testify, yes, the Lord is still good. I don't have to go into alcohol or whatever mechanism you use to escape. And my brother or sister in Christ standing beside me is reminding me, no, God is good. And the spirit of God that you have because of the shed blood of Christ can carry you through what you're dealing with today. Praise God. So I remind one another. 
telling you, don't do life alone. Get off the sidelines. Get involved. Because it's not just in here where we're singing beside each other. It's also across dining room tables, right? Y'all, when it comes to, I think this is all couched in walk in wisdom, right? Like this is all this last part, walk in wisdom. You get involved in the community of God so that your family's wisdom doesn't come from Disney or the Billboard Top 100. It comes from the powerful truths of Scripture that we bring as bringers of grace to one another. And lastly, I'll say, remember verse 1 in all of this. Walk as dearly loved children. You are, if you are in Christ, man, God loves you. Actually, regardless of whether you're in Christ or not, God loves you. And if you are in Christ, you have been adopted into the family of God. And if you are not in Christ, you have not received salvation, the extension today is, man, receive his love for you. Christ says, John 17, abide in my love. Or maybe John 15, abide in my love, and then you will bear much fruit. But it starts by abiding. So Christian, go back and make your home in his love. And to those of you that don't know Christ yet, maybe you've been going through the motions, maybe you've been around church for a long time, maybe you thought by being at church that was the same as being in the family of God, and it's not, and you're hearing that today, may receive his love for you. Receive his love. Abide in his love for you. In fact, I can't think of a better way we're going to close. We're going to take communion together at all of our campuses. I'm going to pray for us and then transition us into a time of communion where, as the church, what are we doing? Abiding in God's love remembering that we are dearly beloved children of God. Let's pray together. Father, thank you for your grace. Thank you for your love. Would we walk in love, in light, and in wisdom? Would we help one another to that end? We need you. Use this time of communion we're about to walk into for our good and your glory. Draw our hearts back to you, we pray in Christ's name. Amen. Amen. Here's what we're going to do. You're going to have um, members of our team are going to begin to pass around uh, communion elements. I want to say out front, if you're not a Christian, please don't take these elements. Uh, just let the trays, there'll be a tray with bread tray with cups, just let those pass by you. These are symbols that Christ gave to the church to remind the church of his love for them and to remind them what they have said they believe. So if you don't believe it, in fact, scripture goes so far as to say you would eat and drink judgment on yourself. But they're going to go ahead and begin passing these things out now. I want you, as plates are being passed, it's going to take a moment to get around everybody. I want you to use this time as a time to reflect on the message you just heard from God's word. Where is God maybe even convicting you? So I need to confess. I need to walk a different way than the way I've been walking. This is what it's going to mean for me to walk in love, walk in light, walk in wisdom. And you know what that is? Maybe you just need to open your hands before the Lord and ask for courage, ask for conviction. Maybe you don't know. You just need to pray, God, what would this look like for me this week? And let the Lord bring that to mind. I'm going to give us a few moments. Our team's going to play. But you hold on to these elements, and then I'll come back up, and I will lead us to take these elements.